So we are, we are going, we are in the midst of discussion of this uh, topic, physical cyber social computing. So um, we established that uh, social data kind of started in 2003, Web 2.0 was uh, started in 2003, MySpace was first initial, uh, a, you know, uh, uh, example, first example of that. With regards to cyber, um, the concept of web data or uh, web of data, right? And uh, what happened was, uh, as I was telling you, uh, World Wide Web Cons uh, Conference, founded by W3C, and uh, for many years, uh, in, you know, one of the keynote speakers would be Tim Berners-Lee by default. And uh, I remember uh, we were, you know, my organization was always was, was a member of uh, W3C, I said was a member of W3C, my company was a member of W3C and we helped define a couple of standards there. But, um, so I remember uh, in one of the uh, talk, he focused on not the traditional HTML pages and such, but said, you know, even the data, as you, meaning the data you might put in a structured database like relational database, should be on the web. And the one very fundamental aspect, why, the whole characteristics of data changes when a data is on the web rather than a, uh, let's say, a relational database. And what is the most fundamental thing that happens? Fundamental thing. Tim? What's it sensible? It, why? 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 Because it's, right. it's available to everyone on the web. Silo With what mechanism? Yeah. No. Knowledge <coughs> base? No. What, what is? How do you address? Link to. Um, oh, URL. URI, right? Yeah. You see, there is a unique identifier. So, here is your database in, in which there is data, and you have to connect to that database and issue a query. That's what you do, right? Versus, here's the data on the web. And you have a unique URI, and you know what that the system knows, where the object is, and give you back. And the, all the steps you have to go through to access the data on a database, think about it. Vis-a-vis -vis <coughs> on the web, you know, the letter is much easier, much more standardized. Getting a database from Oracle versus from MySQL versus from what? <laughs> There's a difference. There are different commands, there are different you know, steps, right? There are different access control strategies and so on and so forth. Web standardized, right? So, so the cyber thing, and then came, uh, you know, there was just, just the idea, web of data, and then came the principles of link open data. So he, I think, put forward four or so principles, and then, the, you know, uh, uh, and there are others then what, who worked on this link open data. So, um, and then at the same time, then from a more, not just technological perspective, but policy perspective, the government started to buy into this open government. For example, in US you see data.gov, and uh, UK government is even more aggressive, more uh, you know, uh, focused on making all the data that government has make it public. Government is a public institution. Government is, you know, it's for the people, and that people should have access to all the data. That <laughs> principle, of course, not defense data, not intelligence data, but you know, all the data about how much tax we collect per person, or uh, per by county, or whatever those things are, right? Or average price of a house. All these things should be public. That's the idea. All the things that you have to go to uh, find in government register. This is a lot, and who owns it? Well, if it's a public data, supposedly by law, then it should be public. Okay. So until then, it was not the that was not the case. Many government did not have digitized data. Then they started digitizing it, and now the point is that if you digitize, you know how hard it is to put that data in a standardized XML is the <coughs> bare minimum of the standard typically to put it up on the web for others to access. Right. So to give you an example. Uh, what happened here is, um, let's say, if I can get um, um, New York 
city open data. You see here? And here is the portal. And so here, New York City Restaurant Inspector results are available now. But basically, they have put up data on the web. And look at this here, land tax lot, lot output, right? And this is a description, and so on and so forth, right? And the data is accessible, right? And so on and so forth. And then it will say, in this case, well, so, you know, people sometimes just put a CSV file as opposed to, you know, give, 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 use better standards. But nevertheless, data is put up on the web and is there for people to start using it. So my favorite example and value of that was that when Hurricane Sandy hit, um, I wanted to know whether this tweet can be, uh, is more trustworthy or not. Let's say the tweet says, this subway station is flooded. Now I want to uh, have a better, um, I mean I can't be 100% sure because it's a tweet and anybody can tweet, uh, but if I can ascertain that the tweet is eyewitness tweet as opposed to somebody sitting in his apartment imagining and saying something, secondary, tertiary or imagined uh, report, then I would have more uh, belief that, uh, you know, uh, more trust that this, this thing is right, right? So then what I would do? is if that tweet has, let's say, it's, if it's eyewitness, typically it'd be done sent on a mobile, from a mobile phone, and that is more, cha there's a chance that then, uh, you know, location data is provided. So if location data is provided, and this New York City's open data tells me, survey, one of the data sets tells me all the coordinates of all these entrances to the survey. And then I say heuristic, so oh, okay, if it is within 100 feet of uh, entry of the survey or 200 feet or whatever, then I would uh, believe more into that tweet than something that I can't decide, right? So this is just an example of many, many different ways that you can use this open government data. All right. And the third thing is physical. Now in the physical thing also, the internet of things, particularly Physical data that is more accessible, openly available, meaning available on internet. Here, we are saying all these three data types are available. They're all available on the internet or web. And hence, much more broadly available. And if possible, available using some standards, like LeekoPod data. Right? Like sensor description standard, like something else. And so physical data, again, uh, the Internet of Things is a much more recent thing. Uh, that term it came uh, only, what, two, three, four years ago? So, um, um, and the growth, but the growth is phenomenal. Right? So, um, uh, there is a uh, slide somewhere, I don't know whether I had that slide here or not, um, where I show the growth of different types of data. Yeah, this, this kind of stuff. So this one is for internal things, but you, on this you can put the data on the um, uh, uh, social data also. So uh, there, I believe that um, uh, compared to, let's say, the data that is put on, uh, kind of on traditional web pages, HTML pages and such, um, at some point uh, on the web, you had you know, significant growth of data in HTML. Then what happened was dynamically generated data on the web, meaning essentially accessing a web page is a query that goes against database and pulls up the data. That means anytime you had a database, you could have basically presented it on the web as a web page, right? So, and there were a lot more databases out there in the world, like somebody, a company had a part catalog now, they did not have to put HTML thing for every part. They were just be able to query the part catalog and what price it is, right? So the e-commerce site data or companies, you know, catalogs, this could be put on the web and this number of, theoretically, page, theoretically number of pages you can generate is far more than HTML. Mm -hmm. So that took over. Some <coughs> would call this, and some aspect of this is called, you know, there's a term for that. 
No. Uh, the term is deep web. The, the meaning the data is in the repositories that have been put up on the web. <coughs> now, of course, query mechanism for every database will be different. But of accessing that, you know, how do you, uh, how do you, for, what is the syntax <coughs> of the query? That site owner can decide. Of course, it is typically Q <coughs> equal, to, you know, question mark, that kind of stuff, right? But then it has to be translated into something that goes against your database, right? So, uh, and the br uh, how, uh, whether you will browse and go to a certain place and then get all the products uh, whose name start with A, or some other ways you get to, right? Anyway, that, that happened. The deep web grew substantially and uh, significantly, uh, you know, outstripped the static web. So, they also, the another term is dynamic web. Um, and the crawler, let's say, the tech, the, that, that, that brought in a lot of other technologies, right? The crawlers uh, uh, that uh, got down the fixed static web pages versus the crawler that had to uh, bring out uh, the data that is in a database. That means all the possible pages that could have been created, but they, those are not, they don't exist. So you have to actually, uh, so what Tali had to do in some of this crawling was to formulate the query against the website. And figure it, you know, basically create a, understand the query syntax, and then create the query. For example, I have, um, um, uh, uh, I wanted the information about every stock. So, so, so let's say at the end of the uh, day, meaning at 4:30 or whenever the uh, New York Stock Exchange or Nasdaq officially closes for the, you know, uh, day trading, there is a a price at the end of the day, right? Mm -hmm. Now, um, that typically won't be a price on a web page. Instead, that is a data, is a, that's in a database. So what you will have to do? You would have to um, understand how I can get that page. Suppose the um, uh, stock symbol is FB. That means I would say, well, here's a question syntax equal to FB. And FB comes from my list of all the stock symbols. So I'll send a query for that. It will come back with the you know, information about Facebook, which, which will have at some certain place, which will have its own, you know, you know where exactly the um, uh, stock uh, data, meaning closing price, will show up on the page. And so you'll know how to write regular expression to pull up that data. But I'll have to get one page at a time for all the stocks by making this query calls, right? All right, now all these data were created by typically enterprises. Who creates database? You and I typically <coughs> don't create database every day, right? And we are computer science, we might even, but you know, a common man <coughs> does not do that. Right? But companies do that. How many companies there are? Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. But what happened with Web 2.0? Web 2.0 means everyone can offer. Earlier, in Web 1.0, the funda one of the fundamental thing is that you know you had to essentially have access to the web administrator <coughs> to get your data uh, up on the web. Right? In Web 2.0, what does it mean? User-generated content. So what happened? All right, so let's ask question. Uh, Kalpa, what happened in Web 2.0? Um, uh, so people started putting on the, uh, their ideas and then comments on the web. So then companies and then research institutions like Google Noises started analyzing them and then make connections between the messages themselves, but like two people uh, commenting on the same, whether they are commenting on the same thing or not, so you can analyze on three different dimensions. So in Twitter, you analyze, we analyze uh, uh, thematic uh, time, space. Yeah, but I can, let's, let's, I was just, I mean, just in the fundamental thing. The point here is that anybody can author, 
anybody who has internet access can author. You don't need to own a database. You don't need to learn how to write HTML. Nothing, right? Somewhere you do, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, comment of uh, you know to a story. Somewhere you uh, put a post on you know MySpace and then Facebook or Orkut. Somewhere you write a blog. Few people would write blog, but a lot more people would uh, put in a little post, status post or something like that, right? Somebody will tweet. That means the number of people who can author or write or express their opinion or observations far exceeded the number of corporations they were. And essentially, uh, the um, uh, it is hard for me to exactly say. Um, I think it's generally, you can argue that um, the user-generated content took over all the other type of content uh, before. That doesn't mean there is not potentially a lot more of other type of con content. For example, if I include every transaction at every retail store and e-commerce store, perhaps that will exceed <coughs> the number of posts. But those will not be put on the web. So I'm not going to claim that a total amount of data in the deep web, which is not on, not on the openly accessible web, is less than the user-generated content. But <laughs> at least the, uh, from the, uh, the available data, openly available data, quite likely the w, you know, web 2.0 data, <laughs> user-generated content, became the largest um, uh, you know, amount of uh, data and content. And literally the largest instances of data, you know, every individual post and so on and so forth. Right? So that, that, that grew, right? Then what happened? So let's, so then came, but what, what, what came after that, Web 2.0? After Web 2, okay, Web 3 has come. And uh, by coming Web 3, so it's become uh, uh, more social, means uh, human could use it more by through the sense you know, of... The, so you, you, the Web 2.0 already had the, uh, uh, you know, the data on the, uh, uh, you, you, you know, the social data, right? So the, I don't think that's by itself an issue. I think what I'm getting to is basically what happened was we started getting a lot more of this Internet of Things or physical data. So that, that's what you started right? generating that hmm? machine started. The machine started. Machine, started. Yeah. Yeah. machine Brain. data. Brain. 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 Pardon? Bringing structure to the social data. That happened, but uh, uh, that no, but that that um, some people started working on structured data. Others, <coughs> they, you know, chose to simply use information retrieval, and I don't know whether you call that structure or not. Well, you're eventually putting structure to it and refining the data to find meaning. Yeah, for that it, yeah. that happened later on, but but uh, just I'm talking about just in terms of data really. Uh, after Web 2.0, data quote unquote, came uh, the data related to what we call Internet of Things, sensor data, general data, or machine general data, right? And um, so, what is the characteristic of machine general data, Shiva? Characteristics in sense of uh, types of data, or uh, like there are five V's of big data. So you can take whatever of the V's you want. <laughs> volume and the volume of the data. Yeah. So, but what happened? Let's say. So, point is, what happened to the volume? How does how does the volume of Internet of Things uh, generated data compare with the volume of Web 2.0 data or, or social data? Cannot be directly interpreted, right? I mean, that's not the issue. I'm just let's, let's just talk about. Let me simplify. Yeah. Let's just talk about the volume. Yeah. How is, how is, uh, what change with regards to uh, Internet of Things data as compared to social data or or Web 2.0 data? Uh, the data yeah. points will be more. Why? There are so many sensors deployed and they are continuously giving the data. But humans will 
send the data free, not frequently compared with sensors. Right. I mean, see, uh, you, uh, you know, in individual, uh, I can do what household number of uh, posts every yeah. day. Yeah, it's limited. Uh, but uh, uh, potentially, I can have a lot more sensors. I can have sensors uh, in my thermometer, you know, room temp, you know, environment system at home. Sensors are already there in my cars, and they can be on internet. Uh, some of them are. Um, I can have uh, sensors in the refrigerator. Uh, for on my behalf, there are sensors that you know give you the data of environment around it. Uh, you have sensors uh, on your smartwatch, and Fitbit is a sensor. Has sensor. Your smartphone has a lot of sensors that you carry around. Mm -hmm. Right. So a lot more. Right. It's, it's conceivable that for every one human, there will be 10 or 20 sensors or more, possibly. Secondly, and so the number of sensors are estimated to be, in 2015, how many sensors? 50 billion. 15 billion. Some numbers vary, but it is clearly, that number, whatever number I have heard, is larger than the number of uh, human living humans. Right? So that much we know. The other important thing is, you can, you are very avid Facebook user. You have ten posts a day, <laughs> but the uh, you know the sensors are const every second or every minute or whatever how often they will take the data. So m amount of data that they create is huge, right? Volume is very high. Velocity, the speed at which they create data is very high, right? The variety is high. I still have the same language I use, but machine, you know, all those sensors are very different, quote-unquote, language representation of the data. So that is there. So um, the amount of data being generated now in for that part of the world has outstripped all type, other type of data. Another very important thing is, can somebody point out one another very important thing, why the data is, can be very high, data sizes can be very high. Jeremy, any thoughts? Why is there a lot of data? Why the amount of data, why the volume of the data, why the size of the data that coming from the Internet of Things or sensors can be very high? Yeah, it's written there, mostly. Mm, no, there's another important thing. Irrelevant. Hmm? Some of the data, data are irrelevant. No, modality. That some of the data could be images. Yeah, they yeah. could be video. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. the yeah. amount of data that you know they um, create is very high. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there is a uh, question. Uh, I mean, I think there's some amazing studies of number of amount of uh, video minutes being uploaded every minute, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, of, there are two things involved here. Yes, there are sensors involved, but there's human involved also. <laughs> uh, <laughs> most of the video that is uploaded is taken by human. But then there is also video that is automatically taken and <coughs> human is not involved. Yeah, yes. traffic cameras. Right. So, so in any case, uh, the amount of data, the number of reasons why uh, amount of data and the, these uh, things have uh, changed, uh, you know, and is different for each of the different kinds of, it's changed a different um, generation of, for different generation of web, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, change with the different, more, you know, way of creating the data, human creates it, machine creates it, what kind of machine creation, and so, so. So these are the, now what has happened is, so the thesis is fundamental thing here is that, in this, we are in this uh, still relatively early part of the century, 20th century, and we have this, um, almost always, all the three types of data available to us, increasingly. So one of the characteristics that I saw, the reason why I wanted to uh, uh, make this a theme with the reason why I wanted to coin this term is physical cyber social and this is another term that uh, others have also used cyber physical social because there has been a uh, term called cyber physical that has been used before I ever used this term it's just that that was not tied with the social to my knowledge as much now uh, so um, uh, mo until last Two, three, four years, much of the emphasis was on building application that process one type of that data. Whether they type process social yeah. data, they process video feeds, and so on and so forth, or whether they 
for all the web data and the e-commerce and so on and so forth. But increasingly, for many, many situations or events out there, we have all the three types of data. So the example could be floods occurring in Jammu Kashmir or Hurricane Sandy. Or the example could be uh, social unrest in Hong Kong or uh, you know Occupy Wall Street. Think about any of the collective you know, events involving more than one person and you'll find that people would tweet or somehow have some social uh, footprint of the event. <coughs> you'll find that there'll be some video taking, some voice recording, some photographs, some uh, other data that is out there, uh, you know, uh, recording of, um, there are many uh, uh, parts of uh, the world where they, they are heavily wired. So if you go to Singapore, every, I expect every, um, uh, you go to Monaco, every space, physical space is monitored with video. If you go to Singapore, I think there is monitoring every intersection in the entire country. Right? So um, if you go to Australia, there is speed thing at, in every metro area at every, you know, so much more often. Right? So um, uh, five people have met somewhere and somebody will know if they wanted to know. Right? And of course, all the snooping that government is doing, uh, you know, in addition to all this. So, the interesting thing here is that you are trying to, um, you, that you are going <coughs> to now increasingly see the applications that involves all these three types of data. That is changing. Or that is, uh, the, the, the reason that I, started talking about is that, that my, my, <coughs> my uh, view is that that is what is going to happen, a lot more. And so I wanted to, you know, give it a term that is this cyber physical social computing, which enables applications that simultaneously use all this type of data. Okay, so that tells me, okay, so, so Pavan, tell me an application that is unique, that I don't know of, that involves all this type of data. Tell me an application involving physical, cyber, and social types of data that I have not heard of. Because if you've seen this one, here, I, I, told, I talked about one application here, right? At least one application. Right? So now, now give your application. Yeah, but I want you to come with your, uh, you know, example, not the one I have here. Google car. I mean, automatic car. Okay, so what is social data there? Uh, the social data, I mean, sometimes like, I mean, it was not implemented, I think. Uh, so if there is an accident or something uh, which reroutes the path, I mean, taking some in other directions to the destination. So we can use the social data over there. We can use it. Is it yeah. using it? No, we no. are not using it. No, I, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, again, that's for that we are already doing it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm already you know, pushing people, you know, I'm already <laughs> taking our organizations to do that research. So, uh, you know, the reason that we are going after this is multiple things. Uh, but one of them thing being, I'm looking for, you know, us to prototype applications of this kind. But I want applications that you come up with that I have not come up with. That's what I'm looking for. Do they exist? Or just no, they possibly exist. Possibly exist. So you can say, well, I mean, he could have made a better you know, uh, uh, argument that uh, in the Google car, I would 
incorporate use of social data to make decisions. Maybe that's what he meant. Huh? That's what I meant that's what to he say. Okay. He didn't say it that clearly. Uh, okay. And you can, you know, you can also say, well, human is involved in interaction, interacting with the system. And uh, see, um, the question is whether Google Car is uh, making the decision on its own with whatever it has decided to be relevant to that, and that does not involve necessarily the human in the loop. And the social activity out there, then it is not the example of PCS. But if it is, if it really also incorporates that data, then it would be. Other thing is all the knowledge it needs, is it um, already in its own system? Or it is actually going to web uh, and looking up cyber you know, data, as in Wikipedia or open government data or whatever it is. If it is if it has all the, all the knowledge in the you know in its own database and the, that's all it needs, it's not a cyber, it does not a cyber component as at least I talk about it. Because I'm talking about data being out there in the web that you're dynamically using it on the, as the, as, uh, on the need basis, as, as needed by the application. One Others? Idea, one idea might, you know, there's already sensor systems for home automation that are out there. I don't know if there are <coughs> systems that um, enable social connections. Maybe they could know, like, hey, if I checked in at a certain location because I'm meeting people after work, that it would adjust, like, why well, turn on my heat now because I'm actually, I've altered my schedule. Um, that, that might be something. That might online. be. That might be, uh, now, to me, uh, this, likes more, this looks more like uh, um, physical and social applications right now. I don't still see the cyber component. The cyber, uh, let me add something which might add cyber component. Uh, if it's an application that involves smart energy, meaning it factors in the price of, let's say, um, uh, uh, electricity, which, is, which can be dynamic. In some parts of the world, mm -hmm. uh, uh, electricity is priced um, constantly. So it's not a fixed price. In US, that is not yet the case as far as I understand. Most, because most US doesn't have that. But uh, dynamic pricing is uh, reality in some parts of the uh, world. And uh, the idea is that uh, you make dynamic pricing, then um, uh, people uh, will make decisions based on the cost or the appliances would also become intelligent and factor in the cost and then make decisions directly. For example, uh, maybe that you understand how well is your um, insulation and uh, that uh, you don't need right now uh, the room to be cool, but you know you need it to cool uh, one uh, hour from now and the price right now is uh, below average. Uh, price likely is likely to be above average in an hour from now. Let me just go and get my house cooler now, right? So, so with the, in that case, you would be looking at the data f on cyber because you have to go to the electricity company or or the exchanges, uh, energy exchanges, to uh, get the price, even the forecast of the price uh, by third party. And now you're getting the data from the web in making decision. And now you have physical cyber solution application. <coughs> specific day he experiences a chest pain but the reason of the chest pain might not be the the, the chest pain not, would not be caused because of his pre-existing condition but because he consumed a particular substance or previous a particular substance or was exposed to some specific different kind of condition like he went to some park or and he had some allergic reaction to that the atmosphere or, or the food he consumed or a specific kind of drug he had, something of that sort. Yeah. Something of that sort he consumed and that is the cause of this condition. 
and the tender infringing would be since he's a chronic heart disease, heart patient, he's experiencing the chest pain. But and if he needs that, yeah, I have been at so and so location, and we can infer from the location that this location has a high amount of humidity or some exposure to sunlight or whatever. He consumes so and so food, and this food, since he's that kind of a patient, he is. <coughs> that might have an allergic reaction to him and that is the cause of chest pain and not his chronic heart disease. So we are combining surgery data, we have sensor data and probably infringing the sensor data. It will be 10 years. Uh, so, so here is the, uh, you know, use of K-Health for uh, heart okay. applications, but we don't have the social component as much in this particular application. Um, I think, yeah, so, you need to you need to think more concretely about it because this was a bit you know too many a lot of imagination was necessary for for this to make sense and it was not as well grounded as I think it can. Um, Tanvi, you want to give an example? Yeah, I I was thinking for again this is a little it could be personal but I've you know as a research assistant I've walked home late at night but as a personal surveillance kind of thing you can mm -hmm. use social media like Twitter. So your friends can track where you are or something. You don't want to, you know, there are a lot of apps where you can directly call 911. Yeah. But you don't want to do that because, yeah. you know, unless it's definitely urgent. So you can use that social component. And if that area is already has surveillance, you can use that information. And maybe even the sensor from your mobile phone. Yeah. So then there you can have, a com you know, components of physical. What society. social component would that be? Something like a Twitter that, you know, okay, I'm fine now, I'm here, I'm okay right now. <laughs> so you're continuing to change. There is WeChat. I mean, I've done that. I've called people on the phone and said, okay, I'm here right now, I'll see you in 10 minutes. So. Yeah. Right. So I think, so it does require, you know. Um, you can also have like shopping applications, right? I have seen proposals from commercials that like they're trying to implement. Mm. Social comp component, like we want to buy something, so you can search whether your friends have bought the same thing on the shop when you enter the shop. Mm. And then uh, cyber thing, like you want to buy something, it will compare the prices for you. Or what about on those like refrigerators that have the the screens that'll tell you what you need? They could also link into uh, your peers and find out what other people are shopping for and make suggestions for you based on what you need and what you are likely to want. Are you likely to eat what your friends eat? <laughs> Possibly. Probably, yeah. I'm, a, I'm hardcore with my friends. Huh? They don't like pizza, I can't be friends. But. Similar ingredients. <laughs> be careful. Okay. Yeah, yeah so, so I think there, there, there's interesting challenges, uh, particularly social and, uh, you know, uh, cultural and behavioral and things of that nature. Okay. Uh, it's not that easy, but... Um, uh, Hopefully you have seen some enough example. Now, you go to um, uh, the area of smart city. You'll find a lot more applications there, right? So, uh, I'll, to give you an example. <coughs> doctor huh? Doctor, doc, doctor So we are part of this project called City Pulse, and here we have. Um, and this, you know, focuses on, um, you know, internet of people and internet of things. So it's physical and cyber, social, uh, but also has, uh, you know, background knowledge. And um, uh, there are a large number of um, scenarios that are uh, they put up on the web. So these are all the example scenarios, right? And, uh, you know, and then you can pick any one of them. Then you can public parking space availability prediction. And and some of them, not all, but some of them are only two modality, others require all the three uh, types of data. Right? So that is that. All right, now let's go to something that is uh, more, uh, not that trivial. Uh, who understood um, this part? So, wants to talk about it. Vishnu, did you understand what I was talking about? Uh, regarding the related talks and presentation. 
No, there is this um, thing from machine centric to human centric vision. Yeah. We are shifting to human centric now to this be like more in the actual intelligence. Uh, so we try. I will simplify that. I will. I'm looking for, and some other people out there also are looking for more human centric. That doesn't mean everybody is using, using, uh, going towards human centric. There are, in fact, there are quite a few blogs, uh, you know, about uh, uh, robots will be our overlords, and uh, that uh, you know, robots will replace you. You know, there are visions where uh, robots will do everything humans do, and people are working towards building very, very, very smart robots uh, that basically uh, replace humans for majority of its. Uh, routine activities and they want to go in beyond that so that is a vision that is more machine centric they would say they are thinking about how to make machines more powerful right and my argument has been and I, I talked to another so if you go to the vision page you might have seen uh, another term what is that term I use that term. What is this term? What, what does this term? Right. So, what is the fundamental? What what viewpoint it tries to sell? It's human. It's human oriented, right? It's all yeah. about You give an example human. of mice. That's how mice like to have uh, about his uh, hypertension. So, it's somehow related to the humans and how human can, by the sensor and from get, giving his data. And by uh, getting that information, how he can uh, reduce a lot of things like cost and yeah, but that's okay. That's not okay. Um, the point here is that um, so uh, I have made. I think I must have quoted um, uh, Mark Weisner here somewhere. What is that quote that Mark Weisner had? What is it that thing that Mark Weisner said? Mohib? Mission disappears. How the mission? Yeah, Mohib? What was that? Okay. You, you, read, you read this? Yes. Yeah, so, you guys. We, I mean, we get the general idea of how to use everything to combine, combine them and get a solution and solve the problems that weren't been uh, thought of in, in the past, like uh, the Parkinson disease or the classification. It wasn't. No, no, you're you going to answer my question. Don't go and be asked. I mean, we have an idea from the reading, but not memorize. Not memorize. Yeah. Okay, don't don't memorize it. Tell me, rephrase it. Isn't isn't it like meshing uh, technology and computers into into human everyday lives? It may, basically, the technology disappears. Like you don't actually realize that it's there. You're just. Yes. You know, te technology disappears in the background, right? So that's right in the first paragraph. There it is. So. Um, Human world and allows computers uh, themselves to disappear in the background. Actually, the person the, the long quoting here, but basically, computers the, you know disappear in the program. It should be like walking in the park. But the point is that uh, so there's another term uh, called uh, the term is ambient <coughs> intelligence. Right. So um, the idea is that, um, and what intrigues me more, what 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 I would advocate for is that. Um, why should human uh, worry about the machines? The question should not be, you know, what machines know about me. We want machines to, uh, sorry, what, what I should know about machines. I want machines to, you know, know what I want and serve my needs. Right? The human should be at the center, serving human is the center, not making machines. Others are interested, and I don't say that that is the wrong uh, cause either. So there are others that are interested in making machines smart. So computing for human experiences also requires very, uh, you know, a uh, lot more technological evolutions, a lot more innovations, uh, just as uh, making uh, robots smarter. Right? 
human should be the masters, not the slave. And hence, and machines should be slaves. And uh, hence, uh, that's that's the vision that is driven primarily by human uh, in the driving seat. Human in the you know, uh, and computers needs to do what ever is necessary to serve human needs in the context. And in fact, what I would like to argue is that I don't want to make my experience uh, synthetic. My experience, uh, uh, I don't want to live in cyber world. I want to live in natural world. The joy of, I, I, I would argue that there is a bigger joy in being part of the natural world that has been designed for us and that, you know, that or that has exist for us, whether you, uh, I'm not going to argue that the God is created or not, I don't care. But, you know, it's, it's a, the experience that we have in the real world is far more uh, interesting than the experience in the silicon world. Or at least there are many, some people like me who would prefer that uh, I create my, I retain my uh, joy of living in the real world and, uh, you know, uh, see the touch of a leaf and, and a smell of a flower as opposed to anything that is created for me synthetically in a 3D cave. So, um, in the ambient intelligence, you have you kind of one you know relation of that is bunch of sensors all around you. So the sensors know what you are doing, and then people are working towards uh, all these things uh, that you know they they make this uh, you know um, uh, thing you, uh, thing you can wear, and then there is electrodes, and they kind of try to say see what part of your brain is firing up and then they can say probably you are trying to do this thing, right? But eventually, you want, uh, they are working towards having the machines um, uh, 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 figure out what human is thinking or what human, in fact, there are, there are only tools where people, uh, you know, wear this thing and uh, the machine uh, is, uh, speaks the thoughts that human has in the mind, that what human is trying to say, people who have lost the voice you know, there are, you know, uh, machines, hardware and software that converts the thought process, uh, the, the, the language formulation in your brain in, in verbalizes for you, right, that those things are there. Today, those things are contraceptions, uh, uh, sorry, you know, contraptions rather, that uh, gives you, you know, um, you have to put this specialized thing on there and there are, you can only walk in this room and that's it. The world is going towards situation where the sensors will be, because the sensors, will, there will be so many sensors of so many different types that a lot more can be understood by the system as to what human wants or needs or desires. So then if my desire is to, you know, improve my driving experience, or the you know you know take a better route to the home, or to um, avoid uh, you know a uh, clogged up road, or to uh, you know uh, go one hour early if I could avoid a, a very heavy downpour. I want the machines to help you know do those things without my overtly going to the machine and telling the machine what I want and how I want and program it for. It to do something for me, and then it, it then there's no charm. If I have to program a computer <coughs> to do something very specific to me, then, then that's not you know. Then, then again, I'm <coughs> making my life highly synthetic. Right? So the idea here is that um, you would want to go towards a vision where um, uh, the cyber physical, social technical, and cyber social. See, I covered all the three physical, cyber, social there. Uh, to support uh, computing for human experience, right? So, um, so uh, now here is the thing that I want to uh, you know say that uh, if you are a PhD student who who is going to work uh, uh, in at least our uh, um, I don't know, but here I'm not at least only you know. If you're going to work along our the line of, uh, you know, okay health kind of project or uh, semantic perception work we are done and all that, it's very important to understand how we position ourselves to, 
you know, some other other exciting and important visions that other presented, the um, sort of father of AI kind of uh, thing, uh, McCarthy's vision, right? And, um, uh, and, and uh, you know, there was uh, 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 by uh, the, the number that I cite here, um, uh, let's see, e Engelbert's vision of augmenting human intellect, right? McCarthy's uh, definition of intelligent machines. So McCarthy's on this AI side, artificial, uh, you know, machine side, and uh, but little lighter was more computer human coexistence. And it's like, these are all you know different pers You know, they all are at a different, a dif a different point in the space. So if you're going to get into uh, building intelligent systems, this is something you need to understand very well to see the legacy that the, all these people have left behind for us. And then make sure what is our space. And I put my bet on the right hand side of the space. Of course, this building, you know, this, I can't build this in one year or something. So it's a progress that we are moving towards. Uh, you know, something that, you know, it's an objective they're working towards, goal we are working towards. And uh, uh, one first concrete step in that context is, uh, uh, the work on semantic perception. Right. Just today, I think I sent somebody um, uh, papers uh, to read on semantic perception. Uh, uh, so, um, all right. Um, so, I, you know, if you really want to understand what is said, you do need to understand this space. And I know. Um, at the least, what I expect people uh, who really want to learn these things is to open a Wikipedia page of uh, Engelbert uh, and, uh, and and see what he has said, and at least look at a paragraph that talks about this thing. There are pages on Wikipedia on uh, uh, you know um, in uh, in, in uh, on all these different topics that I mentioned, all these people I mentioned. So it's worth looking at that. All right, going to the next thing then. I mean, here, what does this show? This shows that. There already been some work at the intersection of two of any of these three things, and you know, really, if there is any uniqueness to the thing that I'm putting forward here, it's more related to having all the three things together. And what, and just saying that all the three are important is not a big deal per se. You know, the big deal is <coughs> what do you get with the synergy of these three things, and what are the um, uh, illustrative application, if you want others to follow you, you want others to think along the way and help you realize a vision, then you really have to put forward what can you achieve with this. Right? So why? Why do you need all these three things? <coughs> and then what challenges there are that, that need to be, uh, you know, uh, overcome? And uh, what unique things you can do uh, that you can't and why it is so good for us, right? So all these things you have to answer, but there are some examples of um, the systems and the, that are primarily, uh, you know, doing these two things at a time. There wasn't much, at the time I wrote about this, and there wasn't much that existed. Um, and so I give examples of some of these things here. And I talked about here, uh, physical, cyber, social, and competing for human experience, and, and, and uh, made some point there. So, uh, this thing we have seen before, right? Do you, you call seeing this before, in a little different form? <laughs> now, there's one concept that this talks about. So, let's see, who wants to, uh, uh, describe the concepts of horizontal operators, operators and vertical operators. If this is one, it is my personal view, one <coughs> concrete contribution of this paper is that. Not, it may not have been very clear to everybody and I've not seen any uh, significant uh, follow through by anybody else, so maybe I've not been that successful. But in my view, uh, this is a very core you know, as a, as a teacher, as a, uh, you know, instructor, as a researcher, we have to, uh, we have to at times be pedagogical, meaning try to put forward 
some complex ideas and possibility into some more structured forms. Right? That's what we try to do. That's what the book is supposed to do. Right? So I think this is the most important pedagog pedag pedagogical uh, contribution of this uh, paper. So what is this? Well, the horizontal operators allow you to integrate data from different sensors or different uh, sources, and that uh, lets you create some more meaning vertical operators move that meaning up to the, to the more abstract concepts, right? So you can, uh, that's where you get the knowledge and the wisdom what to do with the data that you get from the sensor. Precisely. So, um, uh, what we notice here is that um, one of the most fundamental, uh, again, uh, challenge uh, that we face for when you look at this computer and machine in you know continuum is right it is very it's much easier to make machines very smart with regards to consuming one type of data right. tell me a machine learning algorithm that simultaneously uses picture data and some some other type of data. I can certainly think about machine you know machine learning algorithm that uses text and and you know uh, well let's say images. The famous uh, work by Google on cat you know cat as a much the algorithm came up with uh, it was able to automatically recognize cat. Right. So this this is the example of so called deep learning. But just imagine how your brain works right, and just as we speak, as we are sitting. You are consuming audio data, speech, when you're processing that. You're consuming video data, you're looking at my expressions. You're looking at all the pictures there, images. Our brain is so adept at seamlessly processing all these different modalities simultaneously. is the analogy in the machine <coughs> world? You know, what, what, what machine consumes all these data simultaneously in an integrated fashion for achieving a very comprehensive purpose, for a very integrated purpose? I can still think about a video recorder recording, you know, a mass, uh, you know, probe and uh, uh, some other sensor measuring something. So I can, I do have examples, but they are not integrating the data. A human is doing that. A human is having specialized software to integrate data coming from multiple sensors in a very narrow way. But there's a large gap between what machines can do in consuming multiple, multi-sensory, multi-modal data for a common purpose for in an integrated fashion. I don't know any. Do you? So, the point here is that to achieve this, you know, the challenge going forward is to be able to integrate multiple type of data. And for that I call, and when I say data, and I'm not talking about information yet, I'm talking about data, right? But even you need to talk about data, let's say I have to synchronize the data. What time is it? Okay. I want to synchronize the data. Uh, I have to synchronize data at that particular point of time, right? I can't have uh, in my brain, my brain won't work if my the audio and an image or video, uh, other things are not synced. Audio and image are not synced, then my brain won't work. It has to be synced. So when you do these horizontal operators, what you are, what I'm implying here, in which I may not have said because I had a very severe length in the space uh, when I wrote this article for internet computing, they only allow 3,000 some words. So that's what I had to fit in. But, so when, you do, when I'm talking about this horizontal operator, I'm talking about that capability, which no, I'm, I don't I imply that that exactly exists in the form. There is work on integrating structured data as an example. 
there is a work on integrating unstructured, meaning textual, and structured data. But there's still textual modality in some sense. But there is little work on integrating multimedia, me, different media modalities, or different, or what you call sensory thing. This each sensor has its own modality in a way, typically. Right? So your, uh, our, our, our nose is a sensor and that modality is smell. But being able to simultaneously consume different type of modality is going to be critical in future uh, to build this kind of PCS system and computing for human experience. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So that is one thing. And the other thing is traversing the level of abstraction. Your brain is never thinking about bits and bytes. Are you thinking about zero and one or not? And yet, when you are trying to build machines, right, computing architectures, fundamentally is translated into zeros and one, right? Is that, can that work? I happen to think it can't. However, it can be made to partially work by using the right level of abstraction. Here I'll give you one idea and then we'll end this uh, uh, talk. And again, this is probably very critical for PhD students or those who are going to research. Let me say just not just PhD, but anybody who is going to research. So this is the reason why I give extremely high importance to the graph formalism. RDF, it is a graph database, I've, you know, uh, in my you know, group meetings, I've talked about it very often, is that it is a clear progress that if I, my level of work, you know, basically computational thinking is at graph level, you are closer to neurons firing and exchanging the uh, messages from one neuron to another neuron and coordinating whatever they are doing at some level. Even so coarsely, even if coarsely, even if grossly, right? So, um, hey, you can build a machine to convert graph into ones and zeros and take care of it. That's, 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 that's done, more or less, right? So the point is that you build, you know, now you start thinking and building your machinery over graph, which comes closer to more intelligent, more semantic computation. It inherently allows you to uh, connect information in multimodal, multisensory data. Information in multimodal, multisensory data. Look, I'm talking about not data, I'm talking about data being converted into information that can be connected. And hence, that can come to closer to a kind of a form of a computation that perhaps comes closer to our uh, human, you know, very powerful uh, computation that our brains have, if you call it computation. Right? All right, so I, I will continue this. Looks like there's a lot more to go, but I, I want a little deeper thinking, guys. I, I don't want superficial reading. The only, only one answer I was impressed with the whole day was uh, Steve's uh, answer on the uh, horizontal and vertical. All the rest were okay. I, we need to go, we need to, we need to have more depth.